welcome into Mean Green, Ga Green, mean Green Game Day. I'm Sarah Baskin alongside Derek Mims, Connor Hibbett, Shaji Adam. How are we feeling today, guys? Fantastic. Really excited. Fantastic. Everybody's excited. I'm feeling great about it, too. Later on in the show, we're going to preview today's game against Cal. But first, what happened last week against SMU? Really tough loss, 49-27. Where did it all go wrong, and how much of a setback is this, Derek? I feel like where it all went wrong was in the first quarter to start off the game. You ended up the first <laughs> quarter 21 to nothing. You had a horrible first quarter on defense. You just let Shea Michelle do whatever he wanted. You really didn't get the run game going until later on. And when the first quarter ended, you ended up in a hole, and you were trying to play catch up the entire rest of the game. And it makes it your life that much more difficult when you're on the road behind the scoreboard that early. Yep, against the, the rival at that. It. Yeah, and then the momentum just starts to swing. You can feel it even just as a fan, not just as a player on the field. Well, you never like losing to in-state rivals like that, for sure. But with an experienced team like UNT has this year, I don't think we're going to have any hangover. We have one of the best head coaches in the country, not just from the group of five, not just from Conference USA, but the country in Seth Luttrell. I think he's going to have the troops ready for Cal. I know a lot of North Texas fans are shocked about, like, we lost to SMU. We lost, I mean, I'm really not that surprised. We're ter we've been terrible on the road mm -hmm. since we've been a, a university, <laughs> since we've had a football team. Yeah. We just have not been great on the road. 21 nothing in the first quarter we've never been that team to battle back and mm -mm. to come back they are not that type of team mason fine had one of his worst showings on only 152 yards but he did complete 53 uh, percent of his passes he got sacked five times though yet again proving that mason fine throughout his tenure here at north texas has never had a consistent offensive line he just has never had that right when he says hi and he's trying to pass it there's already a defensive lineman in his face but luckily there were some bright spots here and there but Man, just nothing overall to really be proud of. Yeah, it was a pretty tough game. You know, for for one thing, the offense didn't get going. The defense was not great at all. And, like, for you, people like Trey Siggers, he had a good game, but you're going to need a little bit more than that. He can't do everything by himself. Well, let's yeah. talk about Trey Siggers. He was a breakout star in this game. 18 attempts for 164 yards, almost 9.5 yards per carry. How can he impact this team moving forward? Well, I think going into the game, SMU already had their minds made up to stop the pass. And that was first and foremost. I think early in the game we saw that. Um, but I thought Trey did a good job of asserting himself into the uh, UNT offense. And I think SMU was kind of surprised. They were like, mm -hmm. oh, who is this guy? And then they adjusted in the second half. Um, but I think for UNT, this really helps their offense because it adds that other element of surprise. Because everyone's talking about their passing game, but now it's like, oh, they have a running game too. And I, I mean, looking at it, he had a fantastic first game just coming in. Great debut. Can't have a better debut. I'm pretty sure he would have wanted that win, but still, he's already on the radar. It looks like UNT has finally found their replacement for Jeffrey Wilson. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I, I was very fortunate when I came here to North Texas. I got to see his senior year. I got to see his last year, see how special of a running back he was. He looked great. When, when Jeffrey Wilson left, you were missing that person who could just run up the gut, very elusive, can catch the ball uh, in the backfield. He can just do all that stuff. When he left, we didn't have that. And plus, we had a lot of injuries going on. So now that he, Trey Sigurd's here, maybe if he could turn Turner, I want to see how he does later today because now what's going to happen when someone finally pays attention to you, when you finally have film mm -hmm. on you and they finally realize, okay, he's a threat, can he recreate that? Yeah. And when they finally start paying attention to you, you're going to need help from all your teammates, specifically the UNT wide receivers. This year, there hasn't been a wide receiver with a game over 100 yards, and the longest completion we've had to a receiver has been 21 yards. If you can't spread the field, it's going to be hard for Trey Siggers to get that running game opened up, and the offensive line is going to have a long day. And it's really important for the offensive line to help Mason Fine because Cal has an elite secondary. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But for Mason Fine to be able to complete those downfield throws, he has to have protection up front, and they have to get more receivers involved, not just Rico Bussey, but a lot of the others. Too. I mean, they definitely need to get receivers, but what about the defense? I mean, they allowed 503 yards. Yes. 503 yards. They allowed 9.4 yards per pass. You can't have that happen. Shane Bouchelle looked like he was having a field day. It looked like a warm-up for he him. He looked amazing. 21 of 31, <laughs> near 70% completion, 292 yards, and he threw for three touchdowns. Xavier Jones, he had a field day, 16 carries, 127 yards. He also added three touchdowns. Wide receiver James Pro, seven catches, 115 yards. He also had a TD. They were just having their way. Guys, it's been 86 years, well, now 87, since UNT has beaten SMU at SMU. Uh, too many pass interferences in that game. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Way but too many. 87 years. They, everybody thought that this was going to be Mason Fine's great best year because this was his last year. They thought that everything's going to finally come together. They're going to be able to finally put it all together. They got punched in the mouth real quick. Yeah. Lots of senior starters, too. So Absolutely. Like Shaji, what is it about SMU that we just can't seem to beat? 
it's just a house of horrors. It's like the Tom Brady in Miami situation. It's right. just something mm -hmm. about when you go there, your mentality is off. You could be as ready as possible. When you're there, they just know how to get in. Like SMU, uh, SMU had new jerseys with the Dallas right there in the yeah. front. They kept that secret for about six months. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was that. Maybe they got caught up. Like, oh, crap, those are nice jerseys. And nice touch. Yeah. <laughs> but just something about when they go to SMU, they're just caught off guard. But the defense has never been able to consistently get to the quarterback. Yeah. Safeties, we haven't been able to create turnovers. No turnovers were created whatsoever. There's no pressure on Shane Bouchelle. And Mason Fine was getting all the pressure. About five sacks in this game. He was just <laughs> on on the ground the entire time. We're not asking him to be an Alabama or Clemson defense. We're just asking them to create some havoc and create some stops. Just give him time. Give him stops. Yeah. Don't let Shane Bouchelle have a total QBR of 94.4. Right. If you're letting somebody throw be that efficient, it's going to be hard for anybody to do anything. But let me just say this. History is on North Texas side because back in 2017, same thing happened. In game two, they got blown out 54 to 32 versus SMU at SMU. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the year, they did finish nine and five. So maybe this is a good, maybe this is a good showing. Maybe they need to lose at SMU again to finally wake up <laughs> to finally realize, look, okay, we need to start strategizing again because maybe they, maybe they're seeing how crazy new Denton culture is right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Samastro even talked about 39 new freshmen have come in. It's the most we've ever had. Ooh. It, so I think they started buying into their own hype, and I th now I think they're grounded. They needed this loss. They can finally get their confidence back. Yeah, that was a good loss, too. Yeah, Connor, how do you think they're going to get their confidence back after this? Well, they, they have a lot of experience all over the board, but with one of the best head coaches in the country, like I mentioned earlier, I think it will make it that much more interesting for UNT to see how they do it, how quickly they bounce back. But again, with the experience, I love experience. It's one of my favorite things to refer back to. If you have experience, I like your chances that much more because the guys are just more calm. They're not so anxious. They, get, they collect the troop. Everyone gets together like, guys, we got this. We've been around this game for many years now. Mm -hmm. we, we can get together. Guys, we've won so many games out through our careers. Let's end our career. Let's end our senior year on a good note. Yeah, and no matter how much the game of, the game of football changes, there's still one thing you have to do, and that's stop the run. You give up 5.4 yards a carry against SMU, and if you want to be anything successful, you got to start there. I, told, I completely, completely agree. We really were getting beat at the line of scrimmage this week, and so we're just going to have to see how – we can improve that at Cal today. But coming up next, we are going to be talking about college football teams in Texas. They've had a really interesting start. And later on in the show, we are going to be talking about that game against Cal. So all that and more is coming up. So stick around. It really is my world when I heard that she had a tumor. Everything just became dark. When I came to St. Jude, I started to, to get parents, but that's okay. some light in my life. On top of first class best care, you will never receive a bill so that you can zoom in and just focus on this child. The only thing we had to worry about was just keeping Azalea comfortable. St. Jude saved her life and it saved us as a family. The American Red Cross needs your help to install 100,000 free smoke alarms nationwide. Join us April 27th to May 12th. Volunteer at songthealarm.org. <clears throat> Dear humans, this is an adoption campaign. But it's not for me, or Mr. Buttons, or Frank over there. It's for you, humans. This is a call to humans to adopt our movement, to adopt our cause. This isn't just about saving one of us. It's about saving all of us. Thousands of lives, every single day. It's about support for every one of us for, uh, and sometimes not four-legged best friends, waiting to meet a best friend of our own with Best Friends Animal Society leading the charge. Shelter by shelter. City by city. We can save thousands of pets each day. Join us. Together we can save them all. Beautiful hills and highways are green. Wouldn't it be better if they were clean? Only takes one person to make things right. So join hand in hand and protect your countryside. One person starts and another follows through. Well, don't mess with Texas. 
starts with you. I'm Whitney K. Lane. Remember, y'all, don't mess with Texas. Welcome back to Mean Green Game Day. Football season in Texas is back in full swing, and Texas teams have had a really interesting start around the state. We'll get to the best, but first, the worst. Connor, who is the worst college football team in Texas? Right now, I think it's UTEP. I'll have to agree. Their school mascot. <laughs> <laughs> their school mascot. No hesitation on that. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> their school mascot are the Miners, and they are ground zero right now. They were winless in 2017. They had one win last year against Woeful Rice. Some people like to refer to them as Men at Rice. Uh, and then this year, they've already matched. La they've already matched last year's win total with one win. They beat Houston Baptist in the first game of the season. They won by two points at home, but that was against an FCS school. It's not like they, they haven't even faced the best of their schedule yet. They haven't even faced the hardest part of the schedule yet. They lost a lot of production from last year. I think that was partially the reason we saw them losing some close games last year. They weren't too bad for a one-win team last year, but this year is going to be very difficult for them to even come close to two or three wins. True. So I try to focus more on, because I know UTEP, Rice. Those are just teams that have never, ever done really anything <laughs> in yeah. a college football program. They're not really going to make a mark in the top 25 ranking. So I decided to take all the best college football teams in Texas. Which ones were the worst out of the best? And I decided to go with Baylor. I think, I, like ba really? I think Baylor overall, just they've been super underachieving overall as a college football program, especially since RG3. You had such a transcendent talent of a quarterback that unfortunately – just injuries derailed his career when he went to the NFL. But you're looking at 2016, seven and six, three and six in conference play. Y you got a winning record, but you can't do anything in conference play that's not gonna really help. 2017, they went one and 11. You, you can't have that whatsoever. You just take a huge downfall from a, what looked like a promising start. And 2018, they also finished seven and six. And now they're, now they're just look like they're going back to the same footing. They just really haven't been able to find a, a good footing. And they haven't been able to find any good coaches either. Art Browse in 2016, he was a winning coach. He was the one they consistently had for a while. But once he left, they did Jim Grow, but he was one and done after that season. And then since then, they've had Matt Rule. But he hasn't really been doing anything. He's not doing anything to change the program to no. take them outside of the box. They're just there at this point. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Matt Rule had a lot to deal with when he came in. Oh, I'll, I'll give him that. Um, but you have to give him a little bit of credit for going the one win, the seven wins, beating Vanderbilt in yeah. the Texas Bowl was a huge step in the right direction. They have one of the best quarterbacks in the Big 12 and Charlie Brewer. He's being compared to Baker Mayfield, not just because of the high school. They both went to the same high school, but because of what they bring to the table, their intangibles, their ability to be able to make something out of nothing when a play breaks down. And that's something that I can't wait to see what Baylor does this year. They have a very favorable schedule. Would not be surprised to see them get to eight to nine wins this year. But I still, I agree with you on one thing. Uh, they're not to the elite standard of the Big 12 just yet. They won't be able to beat the best teams in the Big 12. And partially the reason because of that is because of the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. They can't win at the line of scrimmage. And until you play defense, first of all, and if you can't win the line of scrimmage, like we talked about UNT and their offensive line earlier, you're not going to have much success. So, For me, I went with a team that has been consistent over a long period of time, and it's been Rice. I feel like Minute Rice, like you said, has, <laughs> <laughs> has never really been a team to challenge anybody in the state of Texas. They usually don't have really good recruiting classes. They're a very small school. Yeah. But, you know, they always – to me, I feel like they're good because they always step up and play big teams. They always play like the Texas's other teams out of conference, and they're never scared to actually play teams. But I feel like they're probably going to have another one of the worst – seasons in Texas for college football Their teams. Their schedule this year is we'll, Yes. We'll see how they fare against Texas. But speaking of Texas, is there any hope for this team after that brutal loss to SMU? Jaji? LSU was a very devastating loss. I mean, Sam Linger, I give him credit. In the first half, he was going throw for throw with Joe Burrow, who is now third in the Heisman mm -hmm. race. He was going throw for throw. It looked like it was going to be back and forth. You were in UT. It looked like maybe they were going to pull away with it with the home crowd. But the second half, a completely different story. Yeah, yeah. And Sam Ellinger, they just they just couldn't do anything. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. They just couldn't do anything. Matthew McConaughey was crying on the sidelines, just trying to win that second Oscar. He just couldn't <laughs> do it whatsoever. 
But I think there is hope for Texas. You look at their next three games, they're at Rice. Like you said, Bennett Rice, not really going to do anything. Versus Oklahoma State, which I think they'll be able to pull off. And they're at a rebuilding West Virginia. Mm -hmm. So West Virginia's not really looking to win anything. So I think they'll be able to take care of business there. So if they do win those three straight, then their next three, that's the tough schedule right there. Because they got Oklahoma, which is their Super Bowl. That's their, the good part of the That's schedule. their championship. If they can beat Oklahoma, they don't care about nothing else. <laughs> right. True. <laughs> I don't think they'll be able to pull that off, unfortunately. I think Jalen Hurts is playing at an all-time level right now. Nobody's even coming close to that. Kansas, I think they can pull that off. TCU, TCU really hasn't really shown me anything. They're not really that team that they used to be. They'll be able to pull it off. Texas will be just fine. I will say that Gary Patterson's had Texas number here recently. Mm -hmm. Yes, he so has. They've always given him good games. Yeah, and G Gary Patterson's one of the most underrated coaches in the country. Um, but for me, I love Texas this year because, I mean, they're a very young team, but we saw early in the LSU game, this is the second game of the season against an experienced SEC grinded out kind of football team. Mm -hmm. Of course, LSU is starting to change their offense now, but they brought back eight starters on both sides of the football, and Texas was still able to hang around with them with a, with a bunch of freshmen. So I think as the season progresses, you're going to see UT start to improve, and I think they'll be one of the best teams in 2020. Yeah, the one thing about Texas in that game was it was a really good game, but the thing that really threw everything off was the two turnovers inside the red zone in the first half. Like, after that, you were playing catch-up the whole time, and you were trying to match scores at LSU. Even though you were, you were still two scores down because you had those two red zone turnovers. Even if you had field goals off of those, it still could have made the game a little bit more competitive. Now I don't understand why. It's fourth and inches or fourth and one. Why don't you just put yes. Sam Ellinger – under center and just push him in. You know, this guy, we, we've been seeing what? that. We've seen that recently because yeah. I think this this huge injury plague has been going around the NFL and college football. Yeah. They just don't want to protect right. your quarterback. You're trying right. to protect right. it, but at the same time, you're trying to win this game right. because college football games, every single game matters. Now Texas still has a chance to make it. Yeah. In terms of good ratings, I think beat right Oklahoma twice. Right now, that's, <laughs> that's hard. Right now, hey Cyclones. They are right now. They're in fourth. Right now, they're 14th in the rankings, mm -hmm. I believe. They can still build that up, and especially in these next three games. But they better be prepared to face Oklahoma. You better do everything possible. You better pray to some things you've never even prayed before to go against Oklahoma. And I'm an LSU fan, but I'm going to say this. I'm glad we played Texas early in the season because they're going to be one heck of a team come November. Watch for these freshmen to grow. They need time to gel. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely right. And once they get this experience, they are talented. Do not get me wrong there. And once things start clicking, Texas is back, guys. <laughs> so do we think Texas is going to be the most successful team in Texas, or what about Baylor, Texas Tech, a and Derek, what do you think? For me, I'm going to go with Texas Tech. I feel like head coach Matt Wells has picked up where every, all the other Texas Tech coaches left off, like Coach Bro, and he's slinging the ball around. They're averaging 41 points a game, 557 yards through the air. And on top of that, they're actually playing a little bit of defense this year. So I feel like Texas Tech, they, they, can, they can do a lot in the Big 12. I see them finishing probably third or fourth. And so, so something that no one knows probably, they were 12th last year in the country in first downs given up. They were kind of an all or nothing defense, but yeah. you know, they're playing a little bit more with an edge and with their offense, it's gonna mm -hmm. be really fun to see. But uh, but for me, Texas is the best team still in Texas. But for, for me, I'm gonna go with Texas A&M next. Okay. I looked at the sidelines and Jimbo Fisher, what he's already doing in College Station, you can already see where he's taking this program. They were third in recruiting this past recruiting season. I, I just think he's going to be able to build something. And, and it's Texas. You're going to get some good recruits. Now, the schedule this year is really different or really, really difficult, but I think they'll be able to pull off one or two upsets in there. It's going to be really interesting to see where they finish in the rankings at the end of the year. A&M will definitely have a great season, but I think overall Texas will have the best season. With Sam Ellinger, like you said, it takes time for those freshmen to gel. Later in the season, I, I, these next three games that they have, that's the building period. That's when they're finally going to gel together, and maybe they have a chance to start going against those better teams. Mm -hmm. I think they'll finally be able to figure it out. Sam Ellinger, he's going to have just a second uh, second breather, chance to breathe, chance to find himself. He's going to come back to form. He's going to be like how he was in the first half in LSU in full games now instead of just being in one half. I think they'll be fine, and then Matthew McConaughey will be saying, all right, all right, all right. All yeah, right I completely right, agree. Right. I, I'm going to go with Texas as well. I think we really owe that to Tom Herman and the way he's been recruiting over the last several years. You know, OU has really been dipping into our recruiting pool at our, at our Texas high schools, and Tom Herman's just getting always. back in there. But let's talk about coaches. Is always been Even good. though it's early on, are there already coaches on the hot seat around the country? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go Willie Taggart at Florida State. I know that's probably Derek's here. I don't know. But, but <laughs> 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 oh, I mean, he's at Florida State. What are you doing right now? They, they haven't even faced the difficult part of the schedule yet. Mm -mm. They faced two group of five schools. They lost to one, barely beat the other, and, and overtime because they missed an extra point. Yeah. And yep. my extra point that I'm trying to make he, <laughs> that I'm trying to make here is that he has too, he has Willie Taggart has way too much talent to be able to do what they're doing right now. Keep in mind both those games are at home. 
they're not playing any defense right now. They're playing Virginia tonight in Virginia. Virginia is looking to have their best season in roughly 10, 11 years. And Virginia has one heck of a defense. And if Florida State doesn't clean up their discipline and clean up their mistakes, it's not going to be a pretty year. And Willie Taggart's going to be on the hot seat. Hopefully they can get some better quarterback play, though. Right. Looking at it, one that I've been thinking about, Chip Kelly. Yeah, I mean, he's been a chip on my shoulder recently looking at the way he's been coaching. They brought him back to UCLA to maybe change this program around. But he hasn't done that. First, he failed as an NFL coach. I mean, he just completely blew it. I mean, it worked, what would you say? It worked for like two weeks? Yeah, <laughs> two, two weeks. weeks. <laughs> it looked like everybody, it looked like this revolutionary coach, and all of a sudden, everything, everybody figured it out. He wasn't doing great with players backstage. He just didn't work. So he left, and now he's back to college. In his first year, 3-9, and nine, and now they're 0-2. They're off to a really and real bad quick, start Derek, overall. What's, who's your pick? Lovey Smith, he's been 9-27 and 27 in the last three seasons. I, I'm going to have to agree. I really agree with all three of you gentlemen on that one. But one thing I might not agree with you on is this debate we're going to have coming up next. We are going to have an age-old debate, and one guy at the desk is, is on the outs. We'll see who that is coming up next. Every child deserves a future. Every last child. That's why we do whatever it takes to ensure children grow up healthy, learning, and safe, right here in the U.S. and around the world, just as we have for nearly 100 years. When it comes to children, we know that even the smallest act can make a big difference. By changing children's lives now, we're changing the course of their futures and ours. Join us. Every child deserves a future. Every last child. That's why we do whatever it takes to ensure children grow up healthy, learning, and safe, right here in the U.S. and around the world, just as we have for nearly 100 years. When it comes to children, we know that even the smallest act can make a big difference. By changing children's lives now, we're changing the course of their futures and ours. Join us. Okay, so what would you bring to my company? What do you need? I need problem-solving skills. I got through high school without a car, a phone, or a computer. No college degree, though. Not yet, but life's taught me a lot, and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire. But you are exactly what I'm looking for. Your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. Here's your check. You, you got it. You know, since I got rid of my car, I really enjoy walking. Okay. Got it. No. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom? That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back in. Today we're going to be talking about, we're going to be previewing UNT at Cal, but first we are going to ask an age-old question. Is college football better than the NFL? Shaji, I want to hear from you. I like the NFL more than college football. Now looking at it, college football, you have about five or six players that play football at a really high level. The rest are just playing because of school, you know, they need bodies or just they're there just trying to go through the motions because they got a good scholarship, but they're not really going to go anywhere in the NFL. Or they do get drafted, but they kind of fizzle out. In the NFL, almost every single player plays at a high level because those are the best of the best, which is why I like the NFL. Now, I do feel bad for college football players because they have to go through that draft process, and they're trying to recruit as much as possible because they want as many people as possible, which makes a good, successful college football program. But the NFL gets the best players possible. I mean, it's a 52-man roster. Only the best make it. Now, don't get me wrong. We'd be seeing some of those backup quarterbacks in the NFL that just should not be playing whatsoever. Gardner Minshew. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's not doing terrible. Remains to be seen. Remains to be seen. <laughs> but just looking at it, it just – NFL just has the best. It has the best quality. It's the most physical. I just think overall the NFL just has better quality. So I'm the one that's going to stick out here. I'm going to go with college football. For me, it's no question. Uh, I love how college football players play the game. It's not just – about for the money, it's not just about the business, but it's also about their passion and for the love for, of their family and for the love of their family on the field with their brothers, on the, on, with their team. They play not just for the game itself, but again, the passion and the passion on the field and off the field, the, the, the fans, 
What they do, they sing the fight songs. They wear the colors. There's nothing like a college game day atmosphere. It's just better, it's just better in my opinion. And the NFL is just really political, a lot of drama. I mean, yes, the players are tremendous, but I, li I, just, I just like the college atmosphere better. One thing I love about the NFL is, like you said, it's the best players. And when you get the best players on the field that get paid, then you get the better games. And I feel like NFL games are always more exciting. You, most college games, you have games that are super blowouts. Like when Alabama plays anybody besides Clemson, they're usually going to win. <laughs> so <laughs> NFL games, every game is every game is close. Every game is going to be intense. Every every team has a chance to win at the beginning of the season, and that's just what I would rather like to see. Hold on, real quick, I want to talk about. You said the NFL is too political. I mean, you're acting like the NCAA is oh, not the NCAA political. Oh, the NCAA is the biggest yeah, it's political bad. body it's ever. The NFL has <laughs> always been like that. You know True, it's always been like that, but at the same time, you look at college football, you look at illegal recruiting processes, and you look at stu students it. students going through terrible schedules, just, not being mm -hmm. able to get compensated. Like there's just so much more drama in the NFL. With, I mean, Antonio Brown. The Antonio Brown like the, situation is bad. The drama is just more televised in, in the NFL I than totally in college. The coverage is just going to be a little bit more because you're getting paid and you're professional. Absolutely. But you know what? In the college, too, the coaches have much more of a say-so. Yeah. So, and oh, that's yeah. College <laughs> is all about and the NFL, coaches. you say something, the, yeah. the, the, the players like, trade me, yeah. release me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And that's Free me. The, the player will always win over the and coach in the NFL. College football is starting to turn into that because of the transfer portal, almost. Yes, <laughs> it's going to be, we're going to get free agency in college Unless football. You're Bill Unless you're Bill Belichick. <laughs> and I'm going to have to agree yeah. with you two gentlemen. I, do, I also think the NFL is better than college football. For me, it just comes down to parity. It's that any given Sunday mentality that w you can go into any stadium and win or lose. And that begs the question, is college football too predictable? Derek? I I think it is. Uh, other than like when you have games against the big teams in the playoffs, then yes, it's a little bit predictable. Even when you, like a couple years ago when we had Alabama versus Notre Dame in the national championship, everybody knew it was going to happen yeah. and it, exactly what we thought was going to happen, happened. Only thing is, I think when college football isn't predictable is when you have like conference rivalries, like when you have Texas, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. like when West Virginia plays any other big 12 team, then that, that's when you get the good rivalries in, in college football. Well, okay, so Alabama and Clemson on their own, uh, are on their own levels. I think mm -hmm. we can all agree with that. Ohio State, Georgia, you can put them in that category too. But everyone else, it just seems like they're all beating, it, beating each other up throughout the season. You have these new and up-and-coming teams. Last year it was Notre Dame, Kentucky, Texas, Florida. This year it may be Utah. Uh, you can throw in a couple of others, maybe hopefully for others, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they're getting a lot of hype this year. But it just seems like there's always that new store in college football. But in the NFL – Entering the season, it's like, oh, who won the Super Bowl? Was it New England? Yeah, New England. Mm. And, and <laughs> it's there's like, yeah, <laughs> it, but it just seems like it's the same old story in the NFL with with the coaches and the players. But for college football, the reason why I don't think it's predictable is because you get these like these schools like Kansas getting coaches like Les Miles. I mean, we're talking about one of your bottom teams in school and winning percentages in school history or in college football history. Kansas has a top ten or worst top ten in terms of winning percentage. And now you get a top coach like Les Miles to try to bring your program up. They beat Boston College last night on a full moon on Friday the 13th. That's what makes college football so yeah. good. I mean, looking at it, I, I definitely think college football is way too predictable. It is, because at the end of the day, like you said, oh, we could have these little battles here and there, but everybody knows who's going to the championship. Yeah, Notre Dame was a huge surprise. Nobody expected them to make it at all, and nobody's make, expecting them to make it again. You're looking at the NFL, they at least can draft. There's a process. You have to trust the process. Look at the Browns. All of a sudden getting Baker Mayfield, Odell Beckham Jr., they're all of a sudden they're all starting to be on the ride. Now, I'm not saying they're Super Bowl contenders. It's going to take time for them to gel together. Mm -hmm. But you're starting to see franchises come and go. They either rise or fall. The Seattle Seahawks, everybody thought they were going to be the next new dynasty. They basically lasted two years. That's it. <laughs> That's what's great about the NFL overall. College, Alabama's been here forever. They've always been winning. It needs to stop. <laughs> Fourth all-time winning percentage. It's ridiculous. Nick Saban has just been unbelievable. The fact that they've had the roll tide defense, they've never even had that many good they, – they haven't been known for quarterbacks. But all of a sudden they got Tua, and they used to have Jalen Hurts. They've had great quarterbacks overall. A.J. McCarron. Yeah, and A.J. McCarron too. The drafting process is easier for the NFL, which is why it's easier, because the best players are coming. Mm -hmm. And another thing, what is with this polling process? Oh, that yeah. doesn't make sense. For sport, it should be about production and how your overall performance should be, not yeah. about voting, about, you know what, even though they lost, I still feel they should make it. No, it's about who is the best team, who should make it. A little political. I mean, <laughs> well, they tried to change it up with the playoff era, but that hasn't really done much. I mean, you're talking about, oh, look at the playoff, we're going to put four teams in it. I mean, what does that do? Do you feel like the playoff is any better than the BCS? No. They okay. need to put eight teams in the playoff. I don't really feel like it's Yeah, because you have the same amount of teams in it, and like the same yeah. four teams it's still like, get it's in. It's like 
it's like college football is like this amazing movie you're watching, you're watching, but then the playoffs come and it's like and this you know horrible twist. It's like this horrible <laughs> twist that doesn't pay out. Why are there only four teams in the playoffs? This should at least be a process where you kind of do a tournament to make it go. I feel like they still want the regular season to actually matter because, like in the NFL, it matters, but like it's not like in college where if you lose one game, then you're pretty much out of it. See, like if they bring eight teams into a playoff, then the regular season doesn't matter as much, and they feel like they're going to lose viewers over that. I think if you put the top eight teams in the playoff. I think that would just help the college game so much because you wouldn't have as much arguing like, oh, TCU, Baylor should be in, yeah. oh, Penn State should be in. Well, that's settled because I think we can all agree there's typically five or six good mm -hmm. teams, but not, but not just four. And we'll talk a little bit more about college football next. We are going to be previewing UNT's game against Cal today right after this. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water, too. That'll probably help. You were probably going to turn down the radio, too, so you could focus, right? Probably OK isn't OK. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and anyway, call a cab, anyway, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on him. So there you are, shuffling through a stack of resumes and you come to mind. This is it, first impression, my way in. But can my resume show you how I truly stand out? Like that I was studying, going to night school while working two jobs just to help my parents pay for groceries. Or being the first one to always step up. No, that's something you just can't put on paper. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent that is dedicated, hardworking, and determined like me. Every year, 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. 40%. That's almost half the food we produce. Food waste is a serious problem. It impacts all of us. And it's expensive. Your family is throwing $1,500 a year in the trash. We're working hard to put food waste on the chopping block. And you can do the same at home. Learn how to cook it, store it, and share it. Just don't waste it. Go to savethefood.com. Welcome back into Mean Green Game Day. Fellas, let's talk about this game today against Cal. Connor, tell me about these two quarterbacks, Mason Fine and Chase Garber. How can these two quarterbacks lead their teams to victory? Well, I think we'll, sl we'll start with UNT since we're the Eagles, of right? Of course. UNT, Mason Fine, I think protecting him is the most important thing. But I think getting more receivers involved and getting the running game involved, that way the whole game doesn't rest on Mason Fine's shoulders. And then the Cal quarterback, I think for he always, Garber's always struggles with interceptions. He sh they, in fact, they were never – or they were one of the worst teams in the country last year in turnovers. If they do, if they have that problem again, this is going to be a really long game for Cal. But the UNT defense is going to have to force some turnovers in this game. They're going to have to be a little bit chaotic. They warn against SMU. They're going to have to create havoc. But I think I, I, between the quarterbacks, I like Mason Fine better. But the Cal defense, I think, is going to be a real issue for UNT in this game. I think uh, definitely Mason Fine overall is the better quarterback. I think Garbers may have a better game yeah. because I don't think UNT's defense is just that good enough to pressure him. They need to step up. They're allowing 197 rushing yards a game, but Cal is averaging a, a 212 a game. Mm -hmm. You can't have that. You need to stop the run because if you can't stop the run with Christopher Brown Jr., who is a stud, a workhorse. Garbers will tear you apart with the play action. Of yeah. And I feel like if Christopher Brown Jr. gets it working today, it's going to be a lot easier for Garbers to – straight up that UNT defense. Now, Christopher Brown Jr., he's at 52 attempts, 349 yards. That's 5.3 a carry. Last week against, U U against SMU, we all know UNT had a real struggle against the run. And if that same struggle happens again, this is probably going to be a really a good 
really easy game for Cal because Christopher Garber's gonna or Chase Garber is gonna be able to get into a rhythm. He's not gonna be able to throw all the interceptions that he likes to throw, and his offensive line is gonna be able to protect him, and that running game is gonna be even better. For UNT, they have to stop the run, and they have to do it over and over and over again because Garber's is not a quarterback like Mason Fine that can pick your team up and complete throws down the field the whole entire game. So for UNT, they got to force some third and longs in this game because Garbers is not the best quarterback in the world. They shouldn't first force third and longs. They need to do turnovers. Yeah. That's right. what they need. You need to take the ball away. I, I, I don't remember the last time UNT really created a true turnover. Maybe against Abilene yeah. Christian, I know they did. Yeah. Because, but Abilene Christian, that was a tune-up game that yeah. you needed. It was the first game. Everybody needed that. It was, all wi it was wide out that day. Mm -hmm. They need to start creating turnovers against these good teams that understand how football yeah, works. And this is a good Power 5 conference team, so it's going to be a good yeah. test for UNT today. Yeah, I agree. They were really unsuccessful with those turnovers against SMU. But, Connor, who are the power players to watch in this game? Oh, for Cal, it's their secondary, the whole entire secondary. They have elite corners and elite safeties. One thing that we see throughout the college game is that we see cornerbacks that can't play the ball well. They don't look around. They don't look at the ball. They just kind of hit the receiver, and, you, and they'll draw a P.I. every single time. These guys can't play one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one, but these Cal cornerbacks can. Justin Wilcox, their head coach, is one of the best defensive minds in the game. He's going to have these guys ready to play. UNT is going to have to just kind of let the game kind of control itself. They're not gonna, they can't force throws. They can't force throws down the field. They're going to have to take the little things and set themselves up in third and manageables and again, they're going to have to control the line of scrimmage in this game because if they can get on the board quickly and get the crowd out of the game against a Cal team who's really emotional coming off that UW win last week, they can get that lead. Cal is not built to score fast and score quickly. Okay, my player to watch is number 89, Evan Weaver, the inside linebacker for Cal. Senior, 6'3", 235 pounds. He's a stud. Stay when he wide. first came in in 2016, 16 tackles, 2017, now 55. Then in 2018, he popped up for 155 tackles. He was just all over the place. He was clearly the brains of the operation. Last game versus Washington, 18 total tackles, 14 were solo. He won the Walter Camp Defensive Player of the Week. Only the fifth California player to ever do it. His favorite team growing up was the Washington Huskies. He did that to a team he likes. <laughs> what do you think he's going to do to UNT? <laughs> And look, and, and to quote an article from the Daily California, they did an article on him. He did a quote, like, and I quote, he goes, my favorite feeling is taking the soul out of someone when you hit them. I like that. That's some Bill Belichick. <laughs> that, that, is, that is a dangerous man. <laughs> so UNT better prep for him because yes, Trey, that's Sig true heart. Trey Sigurds <laughs> did have a great game, but when you're going against somebody who wants to take the soul out of you, you better be ready. Yep. For me, I'm going to go to the Cal secondary and Cameron Bynum. He's, he's their leading leading cornerback in the game but he's only got one interception this year and for what that means to me is that he's a shutdown corner and quarterback is afraid to go to his side so Rico Bussey's in the UNT receiving core is going to have a tough game trying to get trying to figure out Cameron Bynum and get past him and then again we talked about protecting Mason Fine in this game you'll see Cal do this on third and obvious passing situations they'll bring three or four down linemen and then they'll bring Evan Weaver kind of like on a delayed blitz and he's the guy to watch out for. It's not their defensive line. It's Evan Weaver on the blitz. If we can protect or if we can not allow Evan Weaver to get to Mason Fine, give Mason Fine an extra second, he'll be able to get some easy completions, get his, get his confidence going, and get this UNT offense clicking. And let's talk about UNT. How do we match up against Cal and their, and their line play? Well, in terms of quarterbacks, Mason Fine, I think, on paper is better. But this O-line, obviously, Cal's right. is better. So that's why Mason Fine's at a disadvantage. The offense overall for UNT is really good. 39 points per game, but the defense, they're giving up 40 points a game. Yeah. How are you supposed to win with that? You can't, you can't do that. And then the def defense needs to step up. They need to create turnovers. I don't think they'll do that. Then you're looking at Evan Weaver. He's clearly gonna get his tackles yeah, in. He's gonna so get his. Trey Siggers needs to be prepared. Lauren Easley needs to be prepared. Everybody that is playing needs to be prepared. But, but looking, coming back to the offense, third down efficiency is terrible. 34%? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna win anything with that. They need to start converting. They need to start having those long drives. If they keep time of possession on their side, they need to do that. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because in SMU, they led by time of possession by almost 10 minutes. Yeah. And still they got blown out of the water. So that just shows you that defense has always been the key. It needs to be the key. Like you said, defense is the key today. And um, UNT hasn't been, like you said, they haven't been forcing any turnovers. There's only been one interception and two forced fumbles this year. And to top it off of that, your leading three tacklers are in your secondary, which is not a good sign if you're trying to stop the run. Because Cal is averaging 212 yards on the ground, and UNT is giving up well over 212 yards rushing. So Nick Harvey, he leads the team with 14 tackles. He's going to have to find somebody else like a linebacker to help him out out there. Because if um, your secondary is making all the tackles, it's going to be a long day in California. 
Well, we've talked about the line of scrimmage the whole entire time. <laughs> there's no doubt that Cal definitely seems to have the advantage That's going to be the key to it's the about battle of the, the line of scrimmage. Yeah, and, totally. and everyone's going to talk about skill players. We always hear the Heisman. There goes the quarterback, running backs. We've seen receivers have a chance to win. But it's always the skill players that get all, all, the, all the national fame. But we got to give some credit to the guys up front. And for UNT to have a shot to win this game, they got to control the line of scrimmage. They have to be able to keep Cal's offense off the field, give their defense rest. And I think for UNT's defense, like you're saying, the time possession didn't matter against SMU. But it's I not matter today. I think, yeah, I think we have to keep just everything in front of us, allow those three and four yard plays, mm -hmm. and see if we can get stops when you know they're going to run on those third and shorts, see if we can create some tackles for losses and create a couple of key turnovers to see if we can swing momentum. And definitely coaching will also be a key as well. Right. Seth Luttrell, he's, he's always been vocal on the sidelines. You always see him being very energetic. But you look at head coach Justin Wilcox, he took over in 2017. They went 5-7, and seven, then 2016 they went 7-6, and six, so a big improvement. They did lose at the Cheez-It Bowl. Yes, I said the Cheez-It Bowl. <laughs> but, he's take, but since he has taken over, he's actually had kind of a streak. So since 2017, in the first three games of every season, they've won three straight. So right now they're 2-0. and <laughs> UNT looking to break that streak. It's going to be difficult, but I'm pretty sure they want to keep that streak alive. So if you guys could boil it down to two bullet points or less, what needs to happen for North Texas to win, Derek? First of all, like I said, you got to stop the run. If totally. you don't stop the run against Cal, they're just going to grind it out all day on the clock, and you're probably not going to see the ball. First thing, protect Mason Fine. And it's just, there's no nothing more than that. Just protect Mason Fine. Give him time to throw. He's already going to be throwing to tight windows. Give him time. Number two, get on the board soon. Get Cal behind the scoreboard. They're coming off a huge game. They're gonna, who knows what they're gonna be like mentality coming into this game. UNT on the other hand, is coming off a huge, or coming off a disappointing loss. I think they're gonna have a lot of fire, getting Cal behind the scoreboard, making Cal's offense come from behind. They're not built to do that. If, Cal, if UNT can get off to an early lead, that's get the crowd out of the game, create momentum for yourself on the road, that'd be huge for UNT. I 100% agree. You need to score early. We saw what happened at SMU. Like you said, mm -hmm. they were down 21 nothing at the end of the first quarter. You can't blink. have that. Like, blink of an eye. You can just turn off your phone, look back at it, and you see they scored again real quick. That's just how it was. They also need to create turnovers. That's my second key. You need to cut down the mistakes. Mason Fine can't turn the ball over, can't throw those just needless interceptions. You can't have that. You can't just start throwing it up when it's a third and long. You just Hail Mary it. Just pray that Rico Bussey can come down with it. You can't have that. You need to have a really good offense that knows what they're doing, that's very methodical. And defensively, they need to get to him as much as possible, and they need to create turnovers. I, I, I completely agree. I think we just really got beat at the line of scrimmage last week. Mm -hmm. I just think it's all about patience. You, your offense needs to be patient because against a team like Cal, it's going to run the ball a lot. You're not going to see a lot of the ball. So when you do get the ball, you got to do the most with your opportunities. And field goals aren't going to win this game yet. No. No, I don't think so. And I'm actually excited to see what Trey Siggers do. I know we've been talking a lot about the line play, but I'm excited to see what he does as a skill player new to this team. Coming up next, though, we are going to be making predictions for several games around the country. Uh, can TCU take down Purdue on the road? We'll see what we have to say after this. Okay. It's a short ride from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. It's fine that other people like you. It's more important that you like yourself. And I'm comfortable with every part of me. Meals on Wheel coming to my door as someone who's housebound assures me that I'm not forgotten. They care that I'm okay. My name is Asha Ida Bell. America, let's do lunch. Drop off a hot meal and say hello. Volunteer by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This is the moment I knew his future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool.
Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. Welcome back. We are about half an hour away from kickoff in Cal, but there are a lot of other games around the country that we are going to talk about. So first, first game we're going to pick, TCU at Purdue. I'm going to have to go with TCU. Uh, I know it's a long shot there. They're on the road, but as long as they can run the ball effectively and get after that quarterback, Purdue and Purdue's really struggled in that fourth quarter. I'm going to go with TCU. I think Purdue, the, they're a Big Ten team. They're really not going to try to air it out today, and I think TCU and Gary Patterson have an answer for that. Eli Elijah Sindler, the, the, the starting quarterback for Purdue, is questionable right now. He's a game-time decision. But whether or not he plays, I'm looking at TCU and who their head coach is, Gary Patterson. Whenever he comes off of those average 6-6, six and 7-6 six, six years, he always has a breakout year the following year. You look at him the years past, he's always done it. And I think TCU will have 9-10 wins this year. And it starts, I, I cannot wait to see this TCU defense play against Rondell Moore, the receiver for Purdue. Um, look for Rondell Moore to get some touches in this game. But TCU has great team speed on defense. But I think the biggest thing here is the offensive line for Purdue and the offensive line for TCU. I love TCU's offensive line so much more. And I'm going to have to go with Horn Frogs even at Purdue in this game. I love TCU in this matchup. I'm also going to go with TCU. Ooh, love it. Purdue star linebacker Marcus Bailey out for the rest of the season. He is their star player right there. And then Purdue starting QB. He's questionable. He, I think the last we checked, he was a game, game time, time decision. decision. So if he doesn't play, it's going to get ugly. So I'm going with right. TCU. I, I love it. All Texas pick. Next game is Marshall at Ohio Bobcats. I'm going to go with Marshall. One reason. I really trust their head coach a lot more. I like the head coach, too. And Marshall's always been a consistent team. They always play hard. And, you know, West Virginia teams always like to fight. Holiday, oh, holiday. And the best coach <laughs> of the year, Doc Holiday, is an awesome coach at Marshall. I love the Marshall thundering her. They, I think they have a 30 for 30 with him and, uh, yep. and uh, Randy Moss. But uh, love that one. But uh, love that episode. But I'm going to go with Marshall in this game. Ohio's coming off a really tough loss on the road at Pittsburgh 20 to 10. Marshall's coming off a tough loss at Boise State as well. But I'm going to go Marshall even on the road. Now, Ohio has a very good quarterback in Nathan Rourke. But I like Marshall's team overall. I think the Marshall defense gets after Nathan Rourke. Nathan Rourke is missing all, almost all of his skill production from last year. I got to go with Marshall in this game. This could really go either way. But... We're going to have to put that clean sweep up there. I'm also going with Marshall. <laughs> Both are evenly matched, and it's going to be a very, very yeah. physical game. I'm very excited for it. But I just think overall Marshall is just a better team, and they're going to come away with the win. I totally agree. Uh, next game is Louisiana Tech at Bowling Green. I'm going to go with Louisiana Tech because I think that they have just that double attack. You can attack them on the outside, and you can attack them on the ground. I just don't think that they're going to be able to stop that run game. Balanced offense, they're a quality opponent. I'm going with Louisiana Tech over Bowling Green. Bowling Green, is, they're not the strongest team, but Louisiana Tech, they, they, they don't have the work cut out for them today, but it's, it's a trap game. So right. it's, you got you to gotta come to play. You got to pay attention. Don't sleep on Bowling Green, but Louisiana Tech is my team. Yeah, I love Louisiana Tech. They always start the years off so good. In fact, last year they gave LSU a good game, and even though they lost by 31 points to Texas, they still put up over 400 yards of offense yeah. in Austin. This is offense is legit, and Bowling Green's defense is far from legit. I'm going to go with Louisiana Tech on the road. I think they'll cover the spread. Louisiana Tech is a very dangerous team, like you said. They know how to just put the ball in the end zone. They know how to really give good games. But – I'm not giving the clean suit. I'm going with Bowling Green. Oh, okay. I am. I am. Okay. Look, the Falcons are coming off a blowout loss against Kansas State, and they are back home before they go on the road for two <laughs> straight games. I'm pretty sure they're very desperate for this game. Bowling Green is very desperate. They're going to claw their way in. I think they're going to be able to pull it out and beat La Tech. Next game is going to be New Hampshire at FIU. Again, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to go FIU because they're playing New Hampshire, which is a <laughs> Division II school. Yeah. True. I'm going to give me Florida International. They're going to get their <laughs> first win today. They're, they're going to probably air it out, throw the ball around. New Hampshire, they've got the work cut out for them. I don't think they have what it takes. FIU has so much talent. I don't understand how they lost to Western Kentucky last week at home uh, after the disappointing loss at Tulane. Uh, Florida International, they were sixth in returning production. So I don't know what's going on over there in Florida. I think they get their first win of the season today for sure. Um, and I don't, again, I don't know what's going on with FIU, but look for FIU to turn on as the season goes on. I think it's just a case of them buying into their own hype because they were considered to be one of the favorites for the Conference USA Championship. Mm -hmm. And they started with so much promise, they were hyped, but now they're 0-2. You, you, I don't understand how they're in that position right now. They opened the season 42-14 loss versus Tulane. They gave up 350 yards rushing. That's not the FIU way. 
Butch Davis needs to start figuring out how to win. Very good coach. Too. They will win today. They are going to beat New Hampshire. This is the tune-up game they need to get their confidence back up. Completely agree. And now the one we've all been waiting for, Cal at or North Texas at Cal. I am going to pick North Texas today. I think that they are coming off that emotional loss at SMU. I think they've got a lot to prove. I think that they have gone back to their back to the locker room, watched all that film, and I think they're going to attack them on the ground. I think that they're, they've really diversified the offense with Trey Siggers, and they're going to be able to have that balanced offense and double attack. I'm going to go with the unpopular pick today, but let me explain why. <laughs> <laughs> First of the all, I think <laughs> Cal's, off, Cal's run game is going to be a little bit too much for UNC's run defense on the road, so that's going to be something that they have to watch out for. I think um, eventually their Cal's quarterback will find – a way to make things happen, and I feel like um, the run game is going to be too much. Cal's probably going to take this one 28-21. UNT coming off a loss to SMU. Cal's secondary is legit. Justin Wilcox is a great defensive mind. They're playing at Cal. They're playing at home for, Cal, for Cal's sake. They're playing at home. All, all the momentum is, is showing that Cal's going to win this game. Give me UNT on the road. Give me them in the yeah. upset. I'll <laughs> go with uh, my UNT, Mean Green, baby. Yes. I really want to pick UNT. I just don't trust their defense. Cali's going to score early, and UNT just won't be able to come back for it. So, Connor, I think you'll be able to carry on to tradition today. Tradition. The tradition today. Congratulations. Yeah, All right, Connor. <laughs> Put it on, buddy. But I am picking Cali, unfortunately. Mason Fine, he's going to get pressure too much. There's going to be too much pressure. Defense will be able to get to the quarterback. They won't be able to get to Garbers. UNT is going to be <laughs> one and two. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> we have to give a special shout out to Connor. Happy birthday. Co happy hey. 19th birthday, Connor. What a birthday Congrats. present. Thank you you. getting to wear the eagle. What a first show. Your birthday and you're wearing the scrappy. Yeah. <laughs> All coming together. together hey, speaking of you. scrappy, that's what it's going to take for UNT to win this game. they got to be scrappy. All right, you, you know that scrappy. Listen if you're watching scrappy, Connor needs to. All right, and that's going to wrap it up here for us. We are going to see you guys in a couple weeks uh, next away game. but. For all of us here, thank you, good night. And uh, if you want to learn more, go to NorthTexasTelevision.com and follow us on YouTube at NTTV Sports.